Go. Very good morning to everyone. Welcome to this webinar, Elevation to the Next Generation of Shared Services Center, jointly being presented by Deloitte Consulting and Nugen Software. I thank you all for the overwhelming response with more than 100 plus registrations we have received for this webinar. Myself, Glitty Paul, Sales Manager, Middle East, your host and moderator for this webinar today. In this webinar, we have the key speaker, Mr. Tushar Falke from TMT Strategy and Operations, Deloitte Consulting. Tushar has over 14 years of professional advisory services experience. He has worked extensively in the automotive, technology, telecom, FMCG, media, retail, and shared services sectors across multiple geographies, including Middle East, Africa, Europe, and Americas, managing and delivering high impact and high value transformations for clients. From Nugent Software, we have Mr. S. Sriram, who is the General Manager, Global Shared Services Center Practice Head. We would have Tushar discussing upon elevation to the next generation of SSEs in the Middle East, followed by Sriram, who will talk about delivering values to shared services and adding value to clients. At the end of the presentation, we will be having a question and answer session. We request you to type your questions in the question window of your GoToMeeting anytime during the webinar, and I shall take them up at the end of the session with our experts. With that, I hand it over to Tushar. Yes, Tushar, if you can please start the session, that would be wonderful. Thank you, Glitty. Good morning, everyone. Um, and uh, again, thank you for, for participating in this webinar. We're undergoing very challenging and unprecedented times, you know, where organizations' innovation and reliability in, in terms of their people, in terms of technology and processes, have been now brought to the fore and being tested. Um, these unprecedented times call for uh, changes, radical changes within your organization structures, within the way that you look at uh, uh, your people, your process and technology to ensure that you keep delivering the same level of services uh, in spite of uh, this remote working environment. Um, my webinar, uh, my, my topics are basically going to focus on a couple of things. Firstly, what does the current landscape look like globally and in the Middle East? What are the current key challenges that are facing uh, the industry, especially in the Middle East? What are the areas of automation that uh, people within and people and organizations in the Middle East can look at? And some of the case studies that we have observed uh, being successful in terms of moving to a next generation shared services center. So there are more than 3 million personnel involved in shared services and uh, organizations have predominantly outsourced uh, the following functions, IT, finance, procurement, HR. Um, in terms of uh, looking at the key trends, right? Uh, what is currently happening is processes uh, and technology have been combined with robotic process automation self-service applications through clouds and BYOB, your own devices, bring your, bringing your own devices, the cloud environment. And these have all sort of helped to improve the efficacy of 
efficacy and efficiency of shared services. Companies are slowly moving away from outsourcing contracts uh, and they're relying more on SLI, SLA and KPI based contracts, which are more outcome based. Uh, and this is also being driven a lot by, you know, agile and analytics driven processes. Shared services are also looking uh, increasingly at data analytics uh, in their service portfolio of, of, the, of the breadth of services that they want to offer uh, their respective parent organizations or from if, if you're an organization that is focusing uh, on being a profit center and delivering to external clients outside your parent organization, that is also being done. So group companies, clawback mechanisms, all of these are really, really impacting the way that shared services in today's environment are functioning. There is uh, the model of operating model of shared services and moving towards being multifunctional, multi-sourced and multi-business. That this, this means that there is no one particular place wherein you're geographically located and you're spreading the risks uh, amongst different locations. And this basically helps in times like this, wherein you do have different, uh, different places, different people, different teams within your own organization who can pick up work if there is a crisis and a, de uh, and a dependency on uh, on the and there is no dependency on one particular region this has also impacted a lot of uh, the way that we look at talent right the way that we recruit people in terms of their skill sets so people in uh, the center of excellence generally are people who are looking at at specialized skill sets whereas in the shared services you're looking at people with multiple skill sets who can don different hats to perform different functions. The way that this talent is being recruited in terms of uh, not just recruitment, but even compensation and benefits, that is also being uh, looked at very differently using different models by the HR. In the Middle East, uh, there are uh, three predominant predominant countries that are focusing on shared services and delivering shared services. Uh, the first one is obviously the UAE, followed by Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Um, and the most popular functions are obviously HR, finance, and IT. So you'll, you'll see that procurement and logistics hasn't, uh, hasn't taken or, or hasn't been embedded as much. However, a lot of countries uh, from Africa are looking at, uh, especially the UAE, as a, a hub for their procurement and logistics functions outsourcing. Uh, one of the examples is, uh, is MTN, which uh, had created a procurement and logistics office in Dubai. So there are more than 150 shared services. Uh, traditionally, the model was to look at creating capabilities inside, but with the advent of a lot of the cloud solutions uh, in terms of, of uh, Google, Amazon, and them coming to the Middle East and setting up base uh, because of data privacy norms, this has also sort of changed. So people have started looking now at leveraged infrastructure, leveraging people from within the organization, as well as recruiting from outside to ensure that capability is, is not an issue. And obviously, over the last 15 years, as economies in the Middle East move from reducing their dependency on, on oil and natural gas towards being a more service-based economy, these are certain factors in terms of cost, cost arbitrage, cost driving, operating pressures, that uh, have come to the fore and have, spur have spurred on a growth of shared services within this region. Uh, the key trends that, uh, that we are noticing uh, is for the ability to incorporate more functions, uh, especially 
some front office functions in terms of sales, um, as well as supply chain that I mentioned earlier on. The increase in competition, which is actually forcing a lot of organizations to rethink the way that they are performing their manual and repetible tasks within, within uh, their uh, different departments. The adoption of you know, new and disruptive technology in terms of cloud, business process management, uh, robotic process automation, uh, artificial intelligence, IoT, uh, and also a lot of push from the different governments within, within the Middle East to leverage these technologies and ensure that uh, there is a framework that is built, not just from a policy and governance standpoint, but also from a capability delivery standpoint within, within uh, the different countries. There's been an increasing number of mergers and acquisitions uh, because of, uh, of which uh, there Uh, Tushar, this is Blitty. We just lost you uh, for a moment. and to ensure that you know they drive a lot of the technology a lot of the the processes from a global standpoint the current challenges are uh, as you as you all know there is a, a lack of skilled resources um, within within the region so governments again are building on that uh, on the 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 current infrastructure in terms of education in terms of facilities for education to try and impart the best possible quality of education within the region to people who are at least coming out of college um, to and then giving them internships uh, within different organizations there's also large a large salary uh, wage gap in terms of how SSCs, how much SSCs actually have to pay in the Middle East vis-a-vis -vis paying for the same level of skill of resources in countries such as Eastern Europe, uh, the Philippines, and in India. There are different regulatory requirements and, and governance structures that still need to be uh, still need to be fixed. There are the governments are working a lot uh, with uh, with consultants as well as with people from outside trying to basically ensure that there's a common regulatory framework so that re regulations and legalities don't become a, a, a dependency or a hindrance in terms of doing business within the Middle East itself. A lot of organizations have uh, been buying old not old but they have legacy infrastructure leg legacy applications legacy tools and how do these tools then basically ensure that you are not paying too much uh, so legacy infrastructure, legacy applications, these play a very prominent role in trying to ensure that you're reducing your overall total cost of ownership. Uh, I think one thing that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic epidemic has taught us is that we need to be very, very focused on building resilience. We need to have risk management structures in place to ensure business continuity and to also have the kind of technology that can drive this uh, across uh, across the organization while servicing customers and clients. So as organizations move from uh, having a resource center 
to being actually a profit center which can which can benefit uh, not just their individual parent organizations but also organizations uh, that come to them for advice or eventually become clients of theirs whether it's from the same industry or the diff or, or a different industry a lot of this is driven out of the strategy that the organization formulates so moving from being a cost center to a profit center is is a long round drawn exercise there needs to be a lot of maturity that needs to be built within an organization and the strategy uh, and the leadership take this role uh, take this uh, responsibility in terms of driving this so strategy then leads to having a governance structure in place that can ensure uh, things like data privacy things like optimization and leveraging of assets and where where exactly the data is going in in terms of the organization the people capability also right which leads to innovative solutions uh, driven by talent and opening up and unlocking of different revenue models. So uh, essentially organizations are in between the resource center to the global delivery center. Um, some at the upper end are at the uh, global delivery center, but in terms of being an innovation center and then finally being an overall profit center, which will look at market expansion, that is something that the Middle East organize, uh, the Middle East needs to look at um, very seriously because there is a lot of scope uh, for uh, for basically moving up the value chain. So the key areas of automation are, as I've, I've mentioned earlier on, have been HR, IT, supply chain finance and accounting, and now which are uh, Vodafone, um, which has uh, set, set, set up its base in Egypt um, and is doing a lot of work for Vodafone Africa or Vodacom Africa, as well as uh, the Benelux countries. Uh, there are organizations across banking, uh, across uh, telecom, technology, and even government organizations that are driving this change. Um, oil and gas manufacturing, no one thought that it could be done, but the Middle East is again innovating in terms of having the uh, Tatweer Petroleum um, as well as uh, some of the other large majors in terms of Aramco and Sabic, who are also looking at shared services operations uh, amongst, their, uh, amongst their various companies. Uh, all in all, I think uh, there is uh, there is still there's a lot of progress that has been made uh, within the shared services uh, uh, capabilities as well as you know the type of automation the type of technology the type of people that organizations are building or bringing in and there is also a scope of improvement there's the large areas of opportunities large catchment areas which people also need to try and identify and then work towards to ensure that they get the best out of uh, the shared services which they are setting up moving from a cost to a profit center so with that i would like to hand uh, the the mic over to mr shiram from new gen thank you tusha uh, for the insights i'm sure there are a lot of key takeaways 
which will help in more strategizing the decisions. Hi all, good morning. Uh, once again, I thank you for joining this webinar. Uh, from a coverage of this presentation, continuing on what Tushar was talking about, we will talk about some of the digital transformation initiatives, uh, the understanding the needs of the business, IT as well as the shared service and choosing the right one. A representative of proof of best practices based automation, the metric based case study of proven digital transformation, and a brief on the digital transformation tools predominantly of major. While we get into the details of uh, next generation of shared services or the global in-house centers as they are called today, let us revisit an important aspect as part of the research work done by the team. And that is a technology adoption for digital transformation or automation. Technology has been a key player in automation and comes in variety of flavors based on need, timeline to go to market, and also the affordability of the total cost of ownership. ERPs have always been a backbone for transaction processing. While ERPs record valid data, there is a lot of work happening outside them. And these are mostly in silos of application or manually by individuals. Predominantly, this is because of the nature of business that uh, follows the internal guidelines or the standard operating procedures for each business transaction. They are primarily for the compliances and audit purposes. Right? We all know about them. What has happened is many solution providers have tried to automate or give solution in these areas of uh, non-functional areas of the ERP. Some look at enhancing the ERP, some look at providing specialized uh, software which are like bolt-on tools or uh, cloud computing tools, RPA, analytics, and uh, much more, which includes mobility and few other areas. Now, what is important here is, as I said, the digital transformation is an open-ended statement. However, we have to look into what best suits for the transformation of uh, shared services to the next level. So we, let's talk about that. While we are doing the automation, while we are looking at the next generation of shared services, digital transformation and all, what is important is the strategy with which the shared services are established. The key imperatives of consistency, responsiveness, scaling, scalability, and stakeholder delight has to be addressed by any of the solutions which try to add value on top of these ERPs. Right? Most importantly, sorry. Most importantly, the mission of run better today than the previous legacy models and run different or agile in future has to be the focus and cannot be replaced. If you look at the ERP, obviously ERP is the backbone of any organization. Any solution that is going to add value on top has to include the tried and tested features of the ERP it should not be that it is trying to replace or trying to uh, do something different which the ERP cannot support. So what are these, uh, what are the benefits or what is that these end-to-end -end digital solutions will have to take care of are increasing the visibility. Primarily the exception handling which mostly is done through emails and the manual way of working a complete and detailed audit log, timely alerts and reminders, compliance to the standard operating procedure to reduce the non-compliances particularly, and also reduce the cost of uh, penalties and other things, informed decision-making and more of a dashboard for better understanding of what is going on. Now, what are, what are these supposed to do to the business while these are going to take care of the transaction management? What they are going to do the business is make the business predictable. It's going to make the business final in the sense that the business will know that if a transaction comes today, it will get processed in the next one hour, next one day, next two days, or whatever it may be. Before we jump on to the solution frameworks, let us look at what the industry is talking about. There are a lot of uh, industry independent bodies which are trying to come out with uh, 
analysis which they have done across the client profiles. If you look at the key drivers, obviously it's uh, on the transparency, which is visibility, increasing the accountability of stakeholders, and also ensuring that the quality of processing inputs, which could be straight through processing or first time right or touchless, complete digital uh, based processing, et cetera, and et cetera. And currently, if you take the COVID-19 scenario where everybody is working from home, there should be a digital touch point for each and every process that happens as part of the organization. The second most important uh, uh, information on the best practices is about, let's take the most complex one, which is invoice processing. The top performers do it within two days. And of course, uh, the last one and not the least is the average cost of processing, which is around $12 per invoice. Where we are today tells us on how far we have to go to the bare minimum as part of our shared services. Most of us already know and aware of the benefits uh, that digital transformation or any application automation will do. However, most important is on how these benefits enable the business outcomes, which are outside of the shared services framework or KPIs, and eventually the vision and mission also is to attain the benchmarks, industry benchmarks or the best practices, which we saw in the previous slide. The industry benchmarks, which are going to drive the outcomes, can be categorized into two factors, tangible, which are more monetary and cost perspective, and the other one is more of intangible. Efficiency uh, is a resultant of reduced cost of operations, reduced human touch points, we can say or increasing the productivity. Increased straight through percentages is going to provide the benefit of standardization of the process. Increased first time right scenarios as part of the transactions are going to give the benefit of predictability to the business. And of course, the list keeps on, uh, you can see on the screen. The cost benefit are not only direct or intangible as they are here. It is also intangible and intangible also add to the cost benefit uh, by some of the parameters like de-risking of your compliance, etc. Most important is whether efficiency is the standard parameter. No, it's a continuous exercise. And what we say is uh, industry benchmarks keep maturing themselves and continuous process improvement is the order of the day for initial science. The motto should be run faster and better and do it continuously. Due to all the above factors, the need for digital transformation solution becomes imperative. These solutions bridge the gap between the ERPs and the strategic vision of the shared services. While scaling up, enhancing ERPs may or may not help for dynamic business needs due to the purpose they were made for, the cost of uh, modifications, and the overall time it will take to deliver the results which may not give the advantage uh, as derived from the digital solutions. So let us look at the strategy of shared services and the outcomes expected. The bottom line is how to convert the strategy to vision. And for this, we need a catalyst. And the catalyst, as uh, indicated by Kusha in the previous segment, is all about the digital solutions, which comprise of the enterprise content management the enterprise business process management along with robotic process automation of the mobility and also the analytics, which are going to play a key role in providing the efficiency, productivity, and visibility of the new processes. Uh, digital solutions or tools uh, come in their own flavor. And they are all need-based. Everyone, every organization uh, like us innovates based on the need. Solutions become products which may not be 100% fit for all. So they may be fit meant for some, or if you look at a generic way, it may not be the right fit for all, may not. So let us look at what are the options that are available in the market today. Buy is an easy option with the ready-made functionalities like ERP. However, how much do they satisfy our needs versus the adaptability to business with less of change management needs to be carefully considered. 
The second one is a build, uh, which is from scratch. Of course, this is also a right fit solution. However, we have to see the turnaround is as per the market expectation. And also worth considering is the continuous upgrade or the roadmap. The third is the hybrid or platform approach, which is a semi-built uh, solution as per the industry benchmarks of the best practices and customizable as per the business needs. So this provides the best of both options. This will bring a solution that is the best of the world and near to the business needs, making it a win-win for uh, any organization. So a five-step approach, in our experience, a five-step approach will help you to decide the right model to choose as per your needs. The timeline for adoption, uh, the risk identification and mitigation, which is particularly for how much of deviation we are going to do from our standard operating procedures. The capability matrix, which is again from a PCO perspective on scalability. Current need may be for a single automation, but uh, if you look at overall plan for the IT and business, overall plan over a period of, uh, uh, say, a couple of years, then we have to see how much of extendability this uh, product or this solution can help in other areas of automation as well. And of course, the value benefit analysis and uh, the ROI. Our request is that please make a ROI of for approximately three to five years where you will get a, a cost benefit analysis which can support your long-term objectives and visions, both from IT as well as business perspectives. So what are the digital tools and how do we select the digital tool? We look at uh, who are the stakeholders who are going to use this digital tool. First is the IT department. They need to have the best of universal features, latest of the technologies, uh, the integration factors, should support end-to-end -end automation as well as should have continuous upgrades and support models. The second is the business, which takes care of the solution layer. So they should have uh, solutions that are tried and tested as per the business scenarios, which may be part of the current uh, business, may not be, it may be futuristic as well. Seamless interface and a robust process, which takes care of all complexities and uh, scenarios. And the, not the least, uh, the user interfaces, the users who are going to be the primary drivers of this solution. It should be the best fit. It should bring about the best of the user experience adaptable, scalable, and all the features that are required. Most importantly, we should look for a solution that can onboard a user at the fastest possible time so that business can scale irrespective of the resource availability or skill availability. And what should be the digital platform capabilities? Of course, we can talk about uh, all the technology uh, buzzwords in the market today, but what they support is a rapid deployment, rich user experience, compliance, informed decision making, and ensuring last mile automation for better visibility and controls. Let me take a sample uh, solution, which is built on a digital transformation platform, which the hybrid model that I was talking about in my earlier slide. We all know invoice processing. Obviously, we have multi-channel initiation, content extraction, verification, validation, approvals, and, uh, and exception management, and also the posting of the transactions into the ERP. What these digital frameworks or hybrid solutions or platform-based solutions provide is out-of-the-box templates or accelerators. And the balance 30%, which are the gaps are related to personalization, which are additional fees based on region or entity or country specific requirements, the look and feel, integrations with single or multiple instances of ERPs, few other up silos of application, image enablement, uh, real time synchronous data integrations, and also sitting on the IT landscape or policies that are already prevalent in the organization, like uh, single sign on, etc. And of course, standardization, where we talk about multi-entity uh, kind of uh, organization, then each entity may follow their own process and to build separate, separate process for each one of them will be a, 
uh, logo as part of digital transformation exercises. So we have to consolidate them and bring all the nuances of uh, processing into a single framework so that maintenance, change management, and futuristic enhancements can be possible. Let me show you some of the samples uh, an omni channel initiation from physical document scanning or you talk about an email-based uh, introduction into the portal, or a portal-based, uh, uh, vendor portal, the light vendor portal-based initiation, or we talk about an intuitive and informative interface for people to work on, where you see the image on one side with the, all the watermarking or highlighting of areas from where some of the fields got extracted and the color-coded uh, form fields to indicate the level of accuracy of extraction. And you talk about uh, duplicate dedupe checks. You talk about all the previous invoices of this particular vendor, the STP percentile, the audit log, the integration factors, the approvals, which could be in the current scenario where people are working from home, where the extension of applications cannot be done to individual desktops or people may not have access to the applications, then uh, email-based approval to take care of uh, the right approvals or rejections or exception management. And also we talk about the audit of, of approvals and we talk about, uh, we talk about uh, uh, mobile-based access as well uh, so that uh, the approvals and other things can happen irrespective of any time, anywhere uh, people are based out of, and of course, intelligent dashboards to take care of all the operational and the management requirements. Right? So that, that's the power of a semi-built uh, automated platform. And what exactly will change as, uh, from this scenario is the 30% gap, which is spoke about personalization, integration, and uh, uh, in, uh, other problems. Let me uh, talk about some of the case studies. Uh, these are based on the best, best practices based implementation at some of our clients. Uh, let me give finite answers here. Uh, I can give you the exact uh, benefit that they have accrued based on implementation of these uh, platform based uh, solutions. This is a leading pharmaceutical company uh, based out of India. And they have grown even more bigger acquisition of another uh, bigger pharmaceutical organization. The figures that you see are more from a consultant. Uh, rather, uh, these, this particular pharma engaged a consulting organization to validate its implementation so that they wanted to see whether they have really got the benefit or not out of these digital solutions. And the outcome is like this. They got 135% return on investment over a three-year period. 1.6 billion US dollars were the direct and indirect cost savings. 21% reduction in the time and cost per invoice was achieved and 30% reduction in overall cycle time of processing. And this is all types of invoices, you based on euros and much more than that. Let me talk about another uh, similar case, which is on uh, uh, digital transformation based, template based automation. However, the, the strategy or the vision of the shared service, unlike uh, earlier when it was cost saving, was not that here. It was more of value benefits that uh, could be arrived as part of the SSC. The shared service is uh, uh, helping this organization which spans from Australia to uh, the United States, which is across all the geographies or uh, continents of the world, uh, excluding uh, Antarctica. It takes care of uh, all the agro trading part and uh, what we have automated is all the finance and accounts, HR, master data management, logistics, and they have a variety of applications. And we have brought in the standardization of all their process, business processes as part of the shared service automation. The, the value benefit that we have delivered uh, within two years of implementation over here is less than a day of processing. So any transaction that lands up will get processed within the same day or an eight hour working window, which is called a day. Which means business knows that they can derive the benefit of 
liability due of liability from the very next day of sourcing the transaction which means they get an aging analysis right from day one irrespective of whether that transaction is there in ERP or not so the liability reporting help them in better manage their cash flow and hence a lot of other things are taken care as part of it. we brought in a 60 percent first time pass rate which is again more from a finite business perspective which i was thinking the team productivity has improved 91 percent and this is because of all the mundane tasks have been automated through rpa and uh, the business process management uh, features that are built in the smart home. as i said uh, uh, as tushar was also talking about the the automation is not limited to finance and accounts or invoice processing the same platform which we spoke about earlier as the hybrid model can also take care of other areas of automation be it finance be it hr be it legal from a contracts and compliance management perspective or the internals like the research and development or complete enterprise automation and that's the power of these digital transformation tools or the hybrid or the platform models coming to uh, what uh, newgen has uh, has as its platform suite to enable digital transformation as part of uh, shared services and also enterprise level automation is a complete suite right from the initiation or the capture part which is the uh, as i said about as i spoke about in the earlier slides multi channel sourcing Bags, email, portals, or physical documents, getting them into a workflow, processing them, collaborative working, processing them with the discrepancies, exception management, approvals, complex events, rule based routings like parallel routing, serial routings, and also taking care of the audit logs along with the visibility for informed decision making. Integration with the ERP for consolidated data representation for users, etc. Everything is handled as part of the workflow or the Omnipro IPS layer, which includes the robotic process automation activities as well. And of course, uh, the next one is the communication management, where how we take care of the communication, standard communication with our customers, agencies, and also a lot of stakeholders like vendors and others extension of all of this into the mobile solution through native applications as well as smart apps is another uh, important functionality as part of the digital transformation initiative which extend, extends whatever we do as part of the workflow to anywhere anytime access and through our control mode. and not the least is the archival platform which is omnidocs which has a built-in records management solution for retention and disposition Talking about NewGen's SSE profile, uh, we, while NewGen has been there for last 28 years, our SSE practice has been there for last 20 plus years and whatever you see as what we spoke is all the experience, the depth of understanding and implementation of the digital transformation solution at 150 plus shared services. And they span across different business verticals like manufacturing, consumers, retail and logistics, trading, financial services, pharma, government, insurance, and healthcare. And of course, the process areas are unlimited. Some of our clientele uh, include whatever you see on the screen, and uh, they are all of diversified business areas. Newton is a trusted partner rather than just a solution seller or a product seller. We sell the product, we, are, we own the product, we also deliver the products along with the domain, the shared service COE, I get that. We have 28 plus years of experience overall and 20 plus years of shared service implementations, 150 plus implementations, which includes best practices, which are maturing day by day. And also we do have the delivery capability to go agile set up. What is more important is we ensure the successful delivery of our Client requirements. We take the complete ownership for the implementations, and that is our strength. Our product principle owning up the domain as well as the implementation success. Success. And that's what we say is that we are a trusted partner who can add value on a continuous basis to our own. With that, I come to and conclude the end of my presentation. I hand it over to 
put it over back to Bliti for the question and answer. Thank you. Thank you all for patiently listening. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Sri Ram. Thanks, uh, Tushar. It was really great to know that today in Middle East and North Africa, if you see, there are more than 150 plus shared services with the uh, UAE, KSC, and Egypt regions taking the lead. And it's also interesting to know that this adoption is on a rise, you know, evolving into a multi billion dollar industry today. Also, it was good to know that there are different approaches for shared services, which was put up by Sri Ram that a buy versus build where there has been a paradigm shift brought by the hybrid platform approach, which is best of both the worlds. So great. So with this, uh, we would like to move on to the Q&A. Uh, there are uh, a lot of questions I see which has been put up in the question bar. So uh, the first question is for you, Tushar. Uh, the question is, how is digital transformation playing a role in delivering exceptional value and reducing costs at shared services to sure. yeah um, so thanks thanks that's a that's a great question i think in terms of um, in terms of value versus cost right um, it is always incumbent on the organization to firstly focus on the customer uh, and this customer centric approach has been an approach that has come uh, come fairly recently not just in the middle east but across the world putting the customer at the heart of heart of everything um, if you do this it directly means that this impacts everything with respect to the technology that you're using and the processes that you are then using, not just to, to ensure that uh, customer delivery uh, timelines, uh, expectations are met, but also in terms of reporting, in terms of your customer satisfaction, that is also uh, a very, very relevant and a very powerful tool of measurement. So digital transformation in terms of looking at and being customer centric is something that has come fairly recently um, and this means that organizations that had initially looked at procuring their applications as well as their systems to do different functions now these systems and applications need to start focusing on being customer centric which is why a hybrid approach works really well because a hybrid approach can take the benefits that are already being leveraged by these tools and put them into a customer centric approach from uh, from the question of cost optimization it's always cost versus benefit it is in terms of what is the maximum value you want the customer to derive so that there is stickiness that is created and the customer stays with you because as we all know it is very difficult to get new customers it is even more difficult to ensure that existing customers stick to your products and your services. So this is, I think, a, a real challenge in terms of how much are you willing to spend to ensure that your customers do not leave you and you get in more customers, either by way of mouth uh, or in terms of your marketing and advertising spends that you would actually like to do. Uh, that's that's uh, hope hope that answered the question. Yeah, thanks, Tushar. I'll move to the next question. Uh, the question is: Do we have examples of conglomerates who have been able to leverage SEC, considering different IT landscape and processes? Uh, I would uh, request uh, if uh, Sri Ram can take this uh, uh, question as well as I would request uh, Tushar to also answer from the uh, Deloitte Consulting perspective. Yes, this uh, this uh, I have been uh, encountered with in many places wherever I go because a lot of people have invested in many of the applications like silos of automation. And what happens is over a period of time. Bundle of applications, silos of applications that are there, 
makes it difficult for an enterprise application, right? Because the integration with these applications, the seamless data flow for uh, decision making, and few other things are a bigger challenge. What we did at one of our client sites was uh, we first rolled out some of the important key processes as part of this digital platform. And then we started doing a, a analysis of how they are, uh, how the applications, silos of application uh, are working today, what do they value at, which areas they cover. Okay, and then we try to say whether this can be brought as part of the digital platform so that number one, it can come into a single platform if the data exchange is seamless. Number two is upgrades, contracts, support, vendor management, and a lot of other things will, will go away because of the number of applications that get reduced. Which means if you look at the overall PCO for the infrastructure part, the more the reduced the applications, the, the lesser will be the PCO and the larger will be the data. It is not easy task, I agree with you. We have to do a detailed analysis of uh, how the business is using the silos of uh, applications if they are working, if they are doing their job and they are irre irreplaceable in the short term, then we should integrate with them. If they can be replaced, then we should bring it as part of uh, digital platform. The second most important thing is these digital platforms can also play a role of orchestration layer or a wrapper layer or a consolidation layer where the shared services can use the digital platform as their primary application for working. And these digital platform can go push and pull data from various applications at the same time and allow the users to perform their activity. This has also helped some of the uh, organizations to replace their applications without having an impact on the operations. Right? So that, that's, uh, that's a key part. Uh, we should be able to leverage the digital platforms and try to consolidate silos of applications into this by replacing them. That, that's my uh, suggestion going forward. Over to you. Yeah, just to Please. add to that, I think some great points. Um, I think cloud and leveraging cloud also has become uh, a new normal. So in terms of the cloud service providers themselves having a suite of applications that can help the organization identify what applications they need to retain, uh, replace what, what Sri Ram was talking about. Uh, and in terms of renewal also from, from a contract standpoint, that can also be done very easily. Uh, whether these uh, applications uh, on the cloud are hosted in-house, uh, which they are currently done because of legal and regulatory requirements in the Middle East, or once these organizations like the likes of Google and Amazon, which have already started creating data centers within the Middle East for specific countries to ensure data privacy, um, that also sort, sort of comes in and then plays a very important part. So I think uh, the entire Middle East is moving towards uh, this, this cloud-based infrastructure, shared infrastructure, and leveraging this because it does bring the total cost of ownership down dramatically. Uh, and in doing so, it also makes uh, organizations' life in terms of tracking, managing SLAs, KPIs, outcome-based models a lot easier. Some of the organizations that actually started this entire concept of not just uh, looking at shared services uh, in terms of examples, I think Unilever has been uh, a, a, a great proponent of using uh, applications in the cloud, uh, as well as leveraging their own in-house talent and applications. They rely predominantly in terms of servicing from a couple of uh, shared services centers, which are located uh, in in South America, uh, in in Mexico for for North America, in Eastern Europe, in Poland for uh, most of Europe, in Russia, um, and uh, the Philippines, India for uh, for for the ASEAN ASEAN countries. So they've been a very very strong proponent. Uh, they have, and uh, these six or seven 
delivery centers or profit centers as they call them um, global delivery centers they service around 92 countries across the world so that is the power of looking at shared services if you're a if you're a large organization uh, procter and gamble png has been doing it also for for a long time there have been other telcos like vodafone vodafone is a is a great example because they've got uh, shared services centers again in in uh, in india uh, which is doing a lot of the innovation and the product part of things um they've got another center in in the uk uh, as well as the middle east and these three or four uh, different multi location uh, centers are servicing the 20 plus countries that they have under their portfolio okay thanks thanks to shar uh, the next question is how are shared services using bots as a service that's a great question. Uh, Shriram, sir, would you like to answer that or would you want me sure, to? Maybe, yeah, you go ahead. Go ahead. So, um, bots, again, uh, you have to look at, uh, I think there's something that we talked about earlier. Where are you exactly in terms of maturity, right? So, if you're an organization that is just starting the digital transformation journey and firstly does not have uh, the tools, applications, technology, secondly, the people and the culture which is driven towards digital, and thirdly, the processes, then whatever you're doing in terms of trying to get in bots to try and automate your existing application infrastructure uh, will, will not work. So you have to be, uh, in terms of maturity, fairly advanced, wherein things which are supposed to be done um operationally operationally be done uh, which are taking a lot of time for the existing products and applications to do uh, that cannot be done can then be automated using bots uh, you have to understand that bots also are very very customizable and although there is ai being used on bots at uh, and that experiment is still going on in terms of adaptation, uh, they can't do it. So there's a cost of change also involved once a bot is built. So in terms of maturity, you have to be very, very, uh, you have to be ahead of uh, of the curve for in order for you to firstly use bots and then uh, secondly derive benefits out of the bots that you're using. Okay, thanks, uh, Tushar. Uh, I'll just take up the la uh, two more queries. We'll not be able to answer all the queries, so individually we'll reach out to the people uh, who have posted more uh, questions, and we are not able to take it up in this forum. So the last uh, two queries. Uh, one uh, says, what FNA processes should be a priority for organization to automate to smooth working in COVID-19 situation? See, in my view, uh, whatever processes which are focused on the, uh, the business, it should be taken up. Like, for example, uh, the uh, procurement, which is the purchase requisition to purchase order. We talk about uh, all the transactions, the financing uh, transactions, like invoice processing, debit advices, credit advices. These all should be automated. Why? Because maybe it is a transaction to be posted in ERP, but what happens before it gets posted in the ERP is all the collaborative working somebody initiating levels of approvals somebody questioning exceptions resolutions since people are uh, placed in different different locations into their homes perhaps the way they collaborate today may be over a phone and email which may not give you the right visibility so to increase the visibility, it has to be through a digital platform where the collaboration happens through a defined work, number one. Number two is even after the uh, lockdowns and other things are over, when we get back to normal, if we need to have some kind of an auditing done, there should be a clear traceability to how this transaction was posted as per what we are. So whether it is a short term or long term, anything which requires collaborative working should be brought out to the digital platform. That is my uh, thing, Tushar. Yeah, so again, I think uh, 
it all depends on the industry that and the organization that that you work for so as uh, as mr shriram said it all boils down to the fact that whether you have systems and processes and the technology in place to to try and ensure that this works properly there's an audit trail that is created so that traceability does not become an issue and more importantly how resilient are your systems to ensure that you know there aren't any uh, issues when it comes to a uh, cross co cross collaboration between different applications because fna involves banking it involves legal it involves regulatory so uh, the the resilience in terms of the cybersecurity that you have currently within your organization and whether a person who's working from home has the same kind of uh, of resilience built in to the system in terms of firewalls in terms of identification in terms of applications that also becomes a very important criteria so again like i said it all depends on on the industry uh, it all depends on what are what is business critical what is not business critical and where you where you need to have an audit trail to ensure that uh, if something goes wrong you at least have traceability and accountability okay we are running out of time but i'll just take a last uh, uh, question uh, uh, are these transformation projects driven by technology or optimizing the processes to begin with invariably you would come across clients who would engage technology partners where they essentially need a refined process and expect technology to resolve it for them which results in project failures or dragged timelines as not all stakeholders within the organization are on the same page how do you overcome this uh it's 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 a chicken and the egg story uh, which came first right so uh, a lot of organizations drive transformation uh because they because so because they feel that they are being left behind the curve and they need to do something differently secondly it's it's because of the fact that customers are demanding it in terms of the common experience or the omni channel experience across different devices and in terms of uh, identification not just in terms of identification but in terms of interacting with with your different customers via different mediums and methods and devices so technology driving digital processes driving digital people driving digital they cannot be in silos they all have to be a very very combined and concerted effort by the top management to say that look if we need to go digital we need to look at technology we need to look at people who enable this and drive this throughout the organization so that our organization and our people are willing to willing to be digital uh more importantly uh, it's the processes that will enable the technology to work seamless seamlessly and vice versa so one is not more important than the other um having said that uh in this particular situation i think th that the question has come about if technology is already there in place the processes aren't there in place then well you definitely need to have the right business processes in place uh but who is going to drive these business processes where is the buy in going to come from where is where are the people who are actually going to use these processes uh going to be uh, situated located how are they going to work together collaborate uh, collaboratively you know so these are questions that that first should be answered before we actually select how where the outcome should be rather than you know where it should be going in terms of trying to look at the end value that is being created uh, mr shriram yeah good a wonderful uh, explanation to share actually i was trying to say something else but you have given a very good explanation on that so typically what we do we try to say is there are two types of transformation one is business transformation and second is technology transformation business transformation takes care of all the change management from a access versus to be perspective the by awareness technology transformation adopts the uh, sops that are already there as kisha rightly said the processes should be in place so we take the sops or the process uh, definitions and we start working on the technology part either as a 
out of the box functionality or alternative mechanisms or something like that to ensure end to end automation. What we can also think of in this current scenario is to have a vision for long term, have a short term uh, objective of uh, converting the ASIS working model into a technology platform and slowly improve the technology platform as per the business transformation expected. So the tool will help in enabling in a baby step model, improve the processes in the technology way to achieve the larger vision of complete business transformation, right? So it is like, first you want to have technology. Yes, technology can support you with ASIS and then slowly graduating into the uh, right fit process framework. Or if you can start with a larger re-engineering, process re-engineering, and then getting into the technology transformation. Both options are available. And both models are supported through these digital transformation platforms. Okay, yes, thanks, to you. Uh, thanks, Sri Ram, and thanks, Toshar. I'm afraid we have gone beyond the time to accommodate the maximum questions. So the ones not answered, or in case you have more queries, please write back to us, and we will be more than glad to have them all addressed. Thanks again for the entire audience for your gracious time and participation. We will be sending across this presentation to all of you. So goodbye and uh, have a great day ahead and please stay safe. Thanks again.